So hi, um, folks. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, giving time uh, this evening uh, for you and morning for me. And uh, as a part of uh, a series of uh, webinars that uh, Indian Podiatry Association is trying to uh, focus on, we are trying to uh, see if uh, we can spread the knowledge of uh, diabetic foot care and podiatry care and also nutritional uh, knowledge uh, across uh, India and uh, trying to make this uh, a, a focus of uh, transfer of knowledge and also understanding. In the series we have started, we have done one conference uh, webinar and this is a second or third uh, one of the ones we did earlier than this. But uh, uh, today we, we, we will be talking about a series of uh, 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 issues that uh, we have uh, seen as a problem in uh, 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 podiatry care. And uh, basically, uh, we will start on, uh, a, a, this is a second part of foot and ankle focus. And uh, we, we have a good lineup of uh, doctors here, uh, including uh, Dr. Suri uh, uh, and also uh, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Maya, and uh, uh, and also uh, Dr. Gurleen Suri and uh, uh, Pallavi Singh and Dr. Chotala. So all these uh, people will be speaking today. And uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Suri. And uh, Dr. Suri is a, a podiatry surgeon and. Uh, a foot specialist and uh, educated in US uh, and uh, went to India. And uh, I and him have been friends for some time and we started uh, Indian Podiatry Association after uh, we failed uh, at uh, starting a, a, a wound clinic in, in Delhi in 2008 and in 2009 we decided to form IPA. And like you see yesterday there was a, a flight uh, uh, to uh, space uh, from uh, US. And similarly, we have to figure out a way in which we need to change healthcare. And uh, I think that was our moment of uh, trying to understand how could we change it. And uh, we are slowly doing different things at IPA. We started uh, uh, educational processes and also uh, slowly initially we started uh, some other uh, things like uh, uh, platelet-rich plasma and the stem cell therapy, and then uh, hyperbaric therapy also is being done. Uh, Dr. Suri, uh, uh, I would like you to take it away and, in, in, and uh, introduce the other uh, uh, presenters today, and uh, please speak up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ravi, for the nice, kind words. Uh, I welcome you all to all the delegates who are there uh, joined into this webinar. The main aim of today's webinar is that it has been originated or uh, uh, organized by Indian Podiatry Association, as well as we have launched uh, one of the branches of Indian Podiatry Association, which is known as Indian Podiatry Physiotherapy Association. Now, why, uh, if everybody can ask that why IPPA has been done, mainly IPPA stands for Indian Podiatry Physiotherapy Association. Mainly this branch has been devised for the, uh, mainly for the physiotherapists who are mainly interested in podiatric work, who are doing all the physiotherapy work, but along with that, they have more inclination towards podiatry. We all know that we as a physicians or surgeons, we are too busy with the patient when the patients are coming with wounds or non-healing ulcers or neuropathic ulcers or neuro ischemic ulcers. Sometimes the patient don't have an ulcer, but they have neuropathy and they have peripheral vascular disease, altered biomechanics in the foot. They have hematose, bunions, flat feet, high arch foot, uh, plantar fasciitis, or sometimes they have achilles tendonitis, any problem in the feet. So these patients, they really suffer a lot and they keep on going from physicians to surgeons or sometimes when the surgical debridements are done for bigger wounds, like people have cellulitis and infection in the feet. So the basic uh, 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 help the doctors, we as a surgeons need is for offloading techniques and dressings. These are two main things which I see when we have launched Indian Podiatry Association all across the country and we keep on talking with the doctors. So these are two ancillary services which every, every surgeon, as a surgeon, we all need in the health. 
that's the main aim of this IPPA association where a lot of physiotherapists can join, a lot of later on, a lot of uh, uh, diabetes educators or male nurse or female nurse can join this group. And we want to spread education about podiatry into this group so that they can be affiliated with major surgeons or major hospitals dealing into diabetic foot ulcers and diabetic wound management. And they could be part and parcel of the comprehensive wound management to the surgeon or to the podiatric surgeon or to the diabetic foot care surgeon. So that's the main motive of this uh, IPPA association. So I congratulate all the uh, office bearers of this association. And uh, this is the first webinar we are doing. And on 5th of June, we are doing the second webinar. So I hope you, you will get a good take home message out of this webinar. And uh, please free to ask us all, any of the questions at the last. For today, uh, we have four speakers. Uh, Dr. Arun Maya, uh, he is the Dean of uh, Manipal University Hospitals and Head of Department for a Diabetic Foot and Research Center in Manipal. Then we have Dr. Gulin Suri, she is a podiatrist from Northampton University in UK and uh, uh, now she is pursuing her post-graduation. So you can ask her a lot of questions how podiatry is doing in uh, outside and how you can pursue proprietary after your MBBS or before that, she can answer that. Then we have a very good speaker, which is Dr. Palvi Singh from Mumbai, and she has her own physiotherapy center. And she's the one who is the brain behind, uh, along with Shalish, I'll, keep, uh, I'll come to him. So uh, to start up this product of this project of IPPA, and uh, she'll be uh, giving her a lecture on shockwave therapy. That's a very good presentation and very nice uh, uh, field of work of shockwave therapy. So I think you will have a lot of questions out of it. And uh, uh, she's working in Mumbai. Uh, she's the uh, Bachelor of Physiotherapy from Indore Institute of Medical Science and uh, certified MCMT certification from USA. She's a founder of Stride Fitness and Mobility uh, Clinic in Mumbai. And she's expert advisor on a lot of panels like GALF, Get a Life Fitness, Can Innovation India, Ergo Monk, Food Balance, Food Essentials, and she's also associated with Vasily Medical um, uh, Foot and Ankle Lower Biomechanics uh, uh, degree she has done with this. And she has a lot of experience in podiatry uh, working in this. And then the fourth presentation is by Dr. Shalesh Chotala. He is the uh, president of uh, Gujarat chapter of Indian Podiatry Association. He is working in Surat in Gujarat. And he's a lower, uh, limb, lower limb biomechanics specialist. He has done his study from New Zealand. And he's a chief consultant and podiatrist at Chotala Sayona Hospital, Jeevan Jyoti Hospital, Surat Podiatry and Diabetic Foot Care Center. And he's a visiting podiatrist at many good hospitals across the Gujarat. And uh, he has a very good team consisting of plastic surgeon and vascular surgeon and this. So he's also the brain behind the development of this IPPA. So coming down, we have one of the very good uh, and one of the best moderators, you can say, Dr. Rajri Saxena, along with me to moderate this session. He is the General Secretary of Indian Podiatry Association and I'll be proud to say that he's associated with us from, from as a founder member of founder member of Indian Podiatry Association along with Dr. Rajneesh, Dr. Shali, uh, Dr. Ravi from USA, Dr. Sanjay Kale from uh, Kanpur and a lot of other people who started Indian Podiatry Association and he's the been behind all the activities which I or Rajneesh they plan and uh, Ravi and Sanjay and all the core group of IPA uh, does. He's a senior consultant in diabetology working in Ajmer and uh, he's a foot care specialist. He has a very good diabetes, Saxena Diabetes and Foot Care Center in Ajmer. He's a certified diabetes specialist center from Endocrine, Endocrine Society of USA and he's also the founder member of Indian Podiatry Association. So I welcome you to Rajneesh and uh, Dr. Rajneesh, you can come on the mic please and uh, thank you so much. Dr. Rajneesh, are you there? I don't. I... Okay. So I, I'll invite the first speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Arun Maya. He's a, can I have the slides? Uh, Dr. Arun Maya is uh, the uh, president of uh, Karnataka chapter of Indian Podiatry Association, and he's the dean of the Manipal uh, uh, Hospitals, and uh, he's one of the uh, 
members where uh, we have been working uh, along with him for many years uh, into this. And he's also the center, head of the director of Center for Diabetic Foot Care and Research, Mahe uh, University of Manipal. He's completed his Forgetti International Fellowship in University of Alabama, Laser Fellowship from France and Podiatry Certification from UK and Finland. He is the president of Indian Podiatry Association, Karnataka chapter. He is a membership director, World Association of Photobiomolition Therapy, Laser Therapy. Uh, doctors, uh, uh, Dr. Ravi, can we have Dr. Maya's slide? I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. And he is also the expert advisory group, Biomedical Device and Technology Department Program. Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and he has multiple paper presentation uh, in his uh, uh, in his career, and he is uh, uh, one of the very active members, and he is also the chairman of the IPPA uh, group. So I welcome Dr. Arun Maya sir on the on the podium. Dr. Arun sir. So he has to. I don't see him here. He's yeah, okay. I'm just now, sir. I will share. Okay, yes. You can share your screen. Yes. Yeah. And the presentation he is going to talk on today is. Can you able to see the slide, bio... sir? Not yet. Yes. Okay. His topic of today is by influence of biomechanics of foot in diabetes. This is very important. Like any diabetic foot ulcer or any patient suffering with diabetic foot disease. Biomechanics is one of the very basic things, so he will uh, uh, give us some insights into this. Yes, yes sir. Welcome, sir. Yes, sir. Can all of you able to see the slide, sir? Yes. 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 And 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 before you start, uh, for all the uh, all the uh, attendees, please enter your name, email address, and location in the chat box, and mute yourself, please. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Very good evening to all of you, sir. Our the respected uh, president of our Indian Podiatry Association, Dr. Suri, sir, and all the other uh, uh, experts, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Saxena, Dr. Shailesh, Dr. Pallavi, Dr. Gurleen, and all the other members. It's a great honor for me to uh, highlight on the biomechanics of the diabetic foot as a clinician or as a practicing uh, in the diabetic foot. What all the important points we need to know. The objectives of my presentation to understand the applied anatomy and the biomechanics of the ankle and foot complex in type 2 diabetes mellitus. At the end of the sessions, we will be able to assess the biomechanical aspect of the ankle and the foot in type 2 diabetes mellitus. It's important for us to know the quick revisions on the functional anatomy of the diabetic foot. Even though the structurally the foot looks like a very small uh, joint as compared to the hip, knee or the other joint, but functionally the hip foot is having an important role. When you say the locomotion of the body, when we say the ankle and the foot complex give, may in a, in, play an important role in the mobility of an individual. Even though anatomically it is small, but it consists of multiple bones, multiple articulations, strong ligaments, and multiple muscles. And the most important thing is the sustaining substantial forces when during the activity. And the most important, it served to convert the rotational movement that occurs with the weight bearing activities. Why this point is important here is in a diabetic foot, predominantly the patients are having the neuropathy. They don't know how much load they are giving on the ankle and foot complex. This is the one of the common reason for an excessive rotational force causes the, the ankle related injuries in the diabetic foot patient. And the ankle mortis, it is important for the two important movement, the dorsiflexions and the, the plantar flexion. On average, we have a 20 to 25 degree of dorsiflexion and the 50 to 60 degree of plantar flexion. And most important thing is the gait requires 20 degree of plantar flexions and a 10 degree of dorsiflexion. Once again, in a sensory neuropathic patient, they like an examples like Tabis dorsalis or the cerebellar ataxic patients. When they lost, lose their sensations, usually they go for a high, high step page foot or the gait. The same way in the sensory neuropathic uh, diabetic foot patients, they may compensate it with sometimes an excessive dorsiflexions or the plantar flexion 
or sometimes they lack this movement so this is another possible reason for an common repetitive injuries in the ankle and foot of the diabetic foot when we look at the ankle and the foot biomechanical perspective or the assessment point of view anatomically and the biomechanically the foot is subdivided into three important component we call it as the rear foot and the or the hind foot which predominantly consist of the talus and the calcaneum the mid foot navicular cuboid and the three cuneiform bones and the fore foot the 14 bones of the toes fifth metatarsals as well as the medial and lateral sesamoid so if you look at the this is the rear foot rear foot mid foot as well as the fore foot the relevance of biomechanical relevance of this i will highlight in the subsequent slide you look at the biomechanically the pronation and the supination is the two important uh, movements which takes place in the ankle complex or the ankle and foot complex so most of the time when we do the clinical assessment normally we focus on whether the patient is having a neutral excessive pronation or the excessive supination normally when you say the pronation the three body plane of motion in the pronation that is an abduction in the transverse plane dorsiflexion in the sagittal plane and diversion in the frontal plane whereas when you say the supination three body planes of motions in the supination are combined with the movement of adduction plantar flexion and inversion the relevance of this movement also i will highlight in my subsequent slide another important aspects in the biomechanical assessment is we need to look for the the arcs of the foot because in the neuropathic patients all the structures are usually uh, gets affected or start losing their properties even in the early stage of diabetic neuropathy if you look at the clinical practice routinely we focus mainly on the assessment of the neuropathy or sometimes in the uh, the vascular assessment however we are not focusing on the musculoskeletal or the, the detailed biomechanical assessment of the foot and even in our own uh, center studies what we did is uh, ultrasonic assessment of the foot and ankle muscles what we observed is the architecture of the foot is also starts losing its properties even in the early stage of neuropathy therefore the most important changes we can get uh, observe in the diabetic patients is the change in the arch as well as the change in the plantar aponeurosis so why this is important is these two arches are held by the ligaments and the tendons they are important for shifting the weight if you look at it, this uh, picture when you stand or when you walk predominantly in the hind foot keep you you load about 49% of the load and in the foot in the fore foot about 46% of the foot load whereas the mid foot or the uh, takes very very minimum load why this is important is because these two arch the longitudinal the medial and the lateral part of the longitudinal arch and the transverse arch they are acts like a leverage during the walking or the locomotion they helps in shifting the weight from the hind foot to the fore foot but in the diabetes patients because of these changes we observe the two important changes like either there may be a loss of arch or the high arch which usually f one of the common reason for and repetitive plantar neuropathic ulcers or the other injuries if you look at the functions of the arch it's help in proportionate distributions of the weight the weight distributed usually equally through the anterior and the posterior part of the foot the most important thing is there are multiple nerves and the neurovascular structures they are passing through the uh, above the arch and this arch helps in protecting these structures commonly we call it morton's neuroma or other changes or tinel signs sometimes the patient comes because it becomes more clinically significant or more relevant because this arch losses and there is a lot of loading on these structures and arched foot is also dynamic and the pliable and inverters and reverters helps in shifting the weight distribution so as we described earlier the supinations and the pronation of the foot and ankle is also controlled by the transverse and the longitudinal arch the next important structure is the plantar aponeurosis or the fascia this also there is a drastic reduction in the facial uh, structure even in the early onset of the type 2 diabetes uh, as i mentioned earlier in our study even with the duration of 5 years of 
type 2 diabetes we have observed along with the neuropathy there is a drastic reductions in the cross sectional area of the muscle plantar fascia plantar fat pad this all important protective structure and when they start losing their property the neuropathic ulcers or the other ulcers are more prone in the diabetic patients so why when we assess as i mentioned the diabetic foot syndrome com most com now we call it as a diabetic foot syndrome it's a pathological component of all the three the structural change as i said in the today's presentations we will be highlighting more on this structural change when when we talk about this the biomechanical or the musculoskeletal changes neuropathic changes and the vascular changes why this is important is all of us know in india every 20 second the people are losing their one component of the lower extremity it's mainly because of the diabetic foot or the ulcer i think suri sir will endorse my statement because he experienced the like prevention of amputations in these people because on average globally 30 second but in india according to the world health organization statistics on average 20 second we lose the one component of the lower extremity even though my focus of presentation is on the biomechanical assessment but when you look at the diabetic foot it is important for you to assess all these five component most of the time we ignore this in when they come to the hospital or when they come to the diabetic foot center sometimes we are not asking the patients to remove their shoes it's important that in the diabetic foot assessment you need to focus on the neuropathy vascular assessment musculoskeletal assessment this one component for the physiotherapist it is very very important because the limb length discrepancy is one of the common reason for a biomechanical alteration or the limb girth the cross sectional area of the muscle when the insulin resistance is there especially the proximal muscles like the gluteus medius and minimus the quadriceps and the posterior aspect of the leg that is the gastrocnemius they all lose its strength mainly because there is a reductions in the cross sectional area of these muscles because of the sustained or the prolonged insulin resistance so it is important for us to assess all these and in the diabetic foot the intrinsic foot muscle play an important role because the clawing of the foot it is all the more Uh, common factors for developing the ulcers in the base of the uh, toes so it is important for us to assess those and the next important thing is the biomechanical assessment and the the last component is the footwear assessment i will straight away i will come to the biomechanical assessment uh, because today's the focus is mainly on that when we say the biomechanical assessment we focus on the kinetics and the kinematics of the uh, not only the ankle and foot we focus on the entire lower extremity why this is important this according to me especially in india this is the most ignored part in the diabetic foot care most of the time we focus on treating the cause uh, treating the symptoms or the signs maybe when the patient comes to us with the diabetic foot ulcer we look at the foot we try to go for the offloading we go try to treat that but there are various other factors especially the changes in the ankle valgus or the varus the changes in the knee or the weakness of the proximal muscle they are all the contributing factors for the altered biomechanics in the diabetic foot so it is important for us to like removing the pathological forces as i said the cause is mainly a foot but what all other factors which increases the risk for the foot balancing supporting the posture leveraging the muscle tendon providing the functional and safe footwear when you say the balance balancing and the supporting the posture unless you assess the proximal muscle and unless you focus on strengthening those muscle whatever the corrections you do in the foot may not be a very successful uh, interventions or the approach so when we say the diabetic comprehensive assessment that is what we do in our center we go for the detailed neuropathic assessment we go for the detailed vascular assessment we also go for the thermal imaging basically to look at the inflammatory changes in the foot and ankle then the biomechanical assessment focusing on the dynamic and plant uh, static pressure when when you start this facility so in most of the centers we may not have the sophisticated measure facilities to assess the biomechanical assessment of the foot and ankle however if you go for a simple measure like as i said in the walking the transmission of the weight borne by the foot is successfully transferred 
along the heel lateral border the ball of the foot anterior pillar of the medial longitudinal arc and the digits increase in the great toe causes elongation of the flexor hallucis longus flexor digitorum longus which increases the force of subsequent contraction prevention of buckling of the toes is done by the lumbricals in diabetic foot what happens is all these muscles along with the changes in the bony or the other soft tissues like the tendon or the ligaments these muscles also go for a substantial changes so this all this is an another important reason for altered biomechanics in the diabetic foot in case if you don't have any uh, sophisticated measure in the next two to three slides i will highlight on the clinical assessment of the biomechanics just important point is look for the plantar cushion this all in the examination of the foot normally we look for various component like intrinsic foot uh, uh, muscles whether there is any clawing of the intrinsic muscle we also look for any fissure whether we look for the callus and also we look for any changes in the arch and all but this assessment is very very important because the palpating the plantar aspect of the great toe especially the metatarso phalangeal joint because before the onset of the callus there lot of changes happens in the subcutaneous spaces of the plantar fat pad when the fat pad become hard this is the one of the common reason for the subsequent ulcer so the callus and then the ulcer so in the close examinations of the assessment of the diabetic foot palpating this is very very important and based on your clinical evaluation you can call it as a fair or the poor and this why this is important is when you go for a corrective footwear or any other orthotic devices if you find that the soft tissue is hard unable to appreciate the cushioning you call it as a score zero and you need to go for an appropriate uh, offloading to that area so this is the one area if you correct in the beginning of the uh, your clinical assessment of the diabetic foot you can prevent lot of callus and then the subsequent ulceration the next important thing is the height and the congruence of the medial longitudinal arch when the foot is supinated the curve of the medial longitudinal arch becomes more acute at the posterior end of the arch in the excessively pronated foot if you see i think uh, because of the pitch uh, i think you may not able to see excessively pronated foot the medial longitudinal arch becomes flattened in the center you can see the third picture and the mid tarsal joints opens then the last important point you see to compensate the loss in the arch or to compensate the excessive change in the arch this intrinsic muscles will go for the clawing so the moment they starts going for the clawing this is the base of the metatarsal heads start getting the lot of loading and this is the one of the common findings we see in the diabetic foot then what causes this pronation or the excessive pronation or hyperpronation the muscle activity as i said weak gluteus increased external forces like obesity or dr pallavi was mentioning even in other population sports excessive running is an another or the runner this is the most common changes you observe and ankle equinus because of the pronations there is a change in the ankle and then the second rocker bottom of the foot also gets effect uh, altered and this is the one important risk factor in a very severe neuropathic patient if you are ignoring this this is a one important risk factor structural risk factors for the or the architecture of the foot risk factors for developing the uh, charcot changes the next important clinical assessment is the look for the sub talar neutral position whenever you correct the foot either the pronation or the supination always you look posteriorly whether the foot is neutral so why this is important is in the sub neutral sub talar neutral is the position usually in which the fore foot is locked on the rear foot with maximum pronation of the mid tarsal joint the foot is either pronated or supinated in sub talar neutral ss always you look for the range of motion of the dorsiflexion rear foot or the fore foot valgus or the wearer and also another important thing you look for the first ray assessment the subtalar neutral may be an important element in the exercise prescription unless you correct and then if you ask the patients to go for walk or do the activity the 
work the the loading itself will cause us the subsequent complication and also whenever we go for any orthotic prescription it is an important assessment the last important clinical assessment is to look for the first ray when you say the first ray it's a single support unit comprising the, dig, the distal end segment of the medial longitudinal arch and the proper function in critical in allowing the row, load bearing segment of the foot and it is composed of the first metatarsal and the internal cuneiform and location of this articulation is significant since it intersects the transverse and the medial longitudinal arch and the first ray is usually gets affected even in the diabetic foot patients the last point is the windlass mechanism all of you know it is clinically important because it may provide a clear understanding about the relationship between the abnormalities and the biomechanical influences when we say the windlass mechanism it's the the plantar fascia supports the foot during the weight bearing activities and provides information regarding the biomechanical stress placed on the plantar fascia so usually we ask the patients to the or we perform the great toe extension and then look for the windlass changes more than 10 mm of the another important thing is the navicular drop test this helps in assessing the subtalar joint with the patient here basically you look for not the supinations or the pronation you look for the height and more than centimeter 10 mm of drop which indicates the uh, the uh, abnormally pronated position this all the five important clinically the biomechanical aspect of the foot we can do when we don't have any other sophisticated facilities in case if you have the other advanced facility which helps in assessing the plantar pressure distribution both during the standing as well as the gait we can perform those tests as i mentioned earlier this is a simple 30 second test and usually you look for what changes happens in the diabetics and the normal if you look at the plantar scan or the foot scan in the, as i mentioned earlier the 49% of the load in healthy individuals it takes in the uh, the hind foot but in diabetes patient because of the neuropathy because of the structural changes like the arch or the other component they puts maximum load on the fore foot this is the most common risk factors for the subset in diabetic foot or the if you all of us know the neuropathic ulcer this is the most common uh, area in which we see in the patients then diabetic patients are also uh, elderly patients risk for fall is high in neuropathic patients as compared to the as age matched healthy individual according to the studies it is observed that a 60% of the uh, there is a 60% and above the high, risk is high in diabetic neuropathic patient uh, for the fall therefore when you do the gait analysis there are different types of uh, foot scanners are available in the picture we showed the three gait uh, one meter or the three step uh, uh, dynamic gait analysis here we look at the gait characteristics and also we can able to do the posturography in this scanner thereby we understand the balance and the gait so what is most important here is the last component is detailed biomechanical assessment can go with the various camera and we here we measure the proximal joint like the hip knee ankle and the foot complex various range of motion and other weight loading characteristics during the walking so once you complete all these assessment what is your area of interest or we usually we call it as region of interest you have to stratify the foot according to the finding whether you need to correct the rear foot mid foot fore foot or you need to correct the medial and the lateral mid foot or the rear foot or five metatarsal heads or the hallux because sometimes the bunion toe is the most common problems in the diabetic patients also so for the great hallux you observe these changes what changes you need to do based on your detailed clinical evaluation you need to assess and then plan so biomechanics of the foot ulcer when the patient develops severe neuropathy and if you are not able to correct these biomechanical aspect they are prone for developing the ulcerations along with the associated vascular and the neuropathic factors so there is an increased duration of pressure magnitude of the pressure increases increased number of pressure repetitive stress then there is a permanent pathology like the foot ulcer 
how we can correct i just given one example like i what i said i ipa here is i prevent amputation so one cases he is actually recommended for the amputation because he had a bilateral uh, uh, the uh, pressure ulcer he is a very long history of diabetes neuropathy nephropathy retinopathy and all other complications were there the patients on dialysis so he was recommended for the amputations but conservatively we treated him with the uh, the laser therapy with the various offloading measures with the structured or the mobilization and then by two months we were able to completely heal the patient so conclusion care for your feet as your face or you will bury your feet before your face thank you this is our team in manipal we have a faculty research scholars they are all working in the various aspect of the diabetic foot some of them are working exclusively on the biomechanical assessment some of them are working exclusively on the vascular related and some of them are exclusively focusing on the other area so this on the various uh, ongoing research in our center also thank you all just thank you very much dr arun you very nicely explain influence of altered biomechanics in diabetic foot problem as you all know at present there are more than 79 million uh, people suffering from diabetes mellitus it clearly indicate that more than 158 million foot are at risk of developing diabetic foot problem so we have to look after all the uh, problem all the modality all the specialist visa are available to treat the diabetic foot and to prevent the diabetic foot problem and it is not the duty of diabetologist or surgeon or vascular surgeon but involvement all the specialties of uh, medicine or and health sector like physiotherapy dietitian diabetic educator vascular surgeon diabetologist and diabetic uh, nurse or diabetic foot nurse these all are responsible for prevention of diabetic foot amputation that's why uh, we start ippa india i prevent amputation with the help of physiotherapy and other paramedics so after your excellent lecture i will invite uh, dr gullin kuri gullin suri as you all know gullin suri is the daughter of our president dr aps suri she is hello can you hear me yeah yeah go ahead yes 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 yeah, 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 yeah. at, at present she is practicing podiatrist at uh, new delhi uh, with uh, dr aps suri center and she completed podiatry study from university of northampton uk she is registered practitioner with health and care professional council uk she is also a member of royal college of podiatry united kingdom she is specialized in wound care biomechanics and offloading techniques in diabetic foot she is now working on the article of how accurate are smartphones application to detect melanoma now i welcome dr gullin suri dr gullin she will explain how podiatry is essential in the management of diabetes yes. and diabetic foot complications thank you dr saxena for this wonderful introduction uh, this is a great initiative taken by the ipa team with the indian, indian podiatry and Physi uh, physiotherapy association so uh, today today i'll be talking a little about the powerpoint on how how preventive podiatry is essential for diabetic patients and how we incorporate that in our day to day clinical practices so uh, initially a little bit about the history of podiatry uh, the podiatry was first uh, the existence of podiatry was first observed in egypt around 2400 bc and over the generations we have seen uh, many in many important people such as abraham lincoln king of france napoleon etc who have used the services of podiatrists so the first society of podiatry was established in new york it was known as the new york uh, new york society of podiatric medicine association 
and the first school of podiatry was opened in New York. In 2007, the podiatry was listed as the 15th best paid professionals in the Forbes magazine in US, which is a very recognized magazine. So talking about diabetes, India has been called as the diabetic, diabetic capital of the world. And in 2017, it was noted to have 72 million cases of diabetes. By 2025, it is known to be estimated to be grown to 134 million uh, population. According to the stats, foot ulcers and amputations are a major cause of morbidity, morbidity in this world, which now, which our goal should be to prevent, which only can be prevented by early recognition and management of the risk factors. So make sure when a patient comes into your clinic, you do an early recognition, do a full risk factor assessment, and make sure you have a proper treatment regime associated with the condition the patient comes into your clinic with. Uh, uh, during this pandemic area, COVID-19, a lot of uh, clinics have been affected by it. Uh, many journals have been have come out which says that when, uh, since the diabetic patients have a decreased immunity, you need to make sure that you, uh, you do a thoughtful review of the elective surgeries that you want to participate in. So in to, to avoid multiple patients coming into your clinic, adopt the online consultations that we have started. So do a video call with the patient, look at what the condition the patient has, and then proceed through. Make sure if you're calling the patient into your clinic, the, you, have, you have used the proper PPE kit, the patient has, fi has filed up a self-declaration form, and take the proper measures. In corona, uh, one of the common symptoms that we observe is the, is the purple disc discoloration in the toes. So this is an early symptom. Uh, it is similar to that of chillblains or measles or chicken box. So that is a uh, that is a observation that you would see. Patients might complain of pain and tenderness, uh, and then so make sure you do a full review of that. So what exactly is the importance of primary care? Too often, foot management does not come in the primary care setting. So when a patient goes to the clinic, foot management would be one of the least uh, least occupied professions uh, to prevent the onset and recurrence of ulcers. So to avoid amputation, to avoid ulcer formation, what we need to adopt is the regular preventive care instead of emergency inter interventional care. So make sure when a patient comes to your clinic for let's say an ulcer or a wound care, you do your treatment regime and the ulcer is, uh, ulcer is treated, make sure after that you adopt the patient into your med medical records and call the patient in every six weeks, oh, sorry, six months or, or annually, just so that, just so that, you know, uh, just so the patient has been associated into your form. So what are the components of preventive podiatry? First and the foremost would be the early risk identification and history. So when the patient comes into your clinic, take a thorough history of the patient. Does the patient have any medical conditions, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis, just the family uh, family history of cancer or any other conditions. With that, you're gonna get a clearer picture of what the uh, what are the medical conditions the patient is suffering through. Ask the, how, how active the patient is socially, so ask about the smoking history, uh, if the patient is uh, into drinking, what is the conditions, etc. If the patient has undergone any surgeries, that is another important aspect. And then after that, do a comprehensive foot examination. So if the, if the patient's diabetic, do a full diabetic foot screening test, use the 10 gram monofilament, then use the 128 hertz uh, tuning fork, sharp and blunt, do the proper sensory and the uh, uh, palpitation test, etc. And then after that, have a proper treatment regime. So whatever the patient is coming in with, let's say it's an early onset of Charbot. So you make sure what your treatment regime follows it. So do proper offloading to do proper offloading of the patient. Make sure the patient is aware of what shard cord is, what can happen uh, the patient is not, a patient is not compliant. Another aspect is patient education and provider education. So to avoid amputations and ulcer formation, the most we can do is educate a patient on what can happen and what cannot happen. So what are the risk factors of patient not offloading an ulcer area? How it can convert into osteomyelitis, gangrene, amputation, etc. So this is very essential because initially when the patient comes into the clinic, we can do a lot of, uh, we can do all the treatments that we can have. 
But when the patient leaves the clinic, it's the patient who controls his or her compliance. So if the patient is not following your treatment plan, it won't help him even if, he, even if the patient comes to your clinic for one full consecutive month. So make sure the patient is well educated on what the condition the patient has. Again, talking about the screening test. So make sure you do proper screening tests. Do the 10 gram monofilament test on the 10 areas. Then do the 128 vibration sensory test. Have the sharpen blunt test, temperature hot and cold. Use a patella hammer to check the reflexes in the patella, the Achilles tendinopathy, Babinski response, etc. So what are the pressure areas? In, in a diabetic patient, what you would observe are the MTPJ and the DIPJ joints. These are very common areas since the diabetic patients are very uh, very common to know and have a claw foot or a hammer toe. So what they, when they're walking, these areas are prone to callus formations. If we do not remove this callus, what happens is ischemic necrosis takes place, causing subcutaneous hemorrhage. When this occurs, there is a neuropathic ulcer formation, and then that would uh, that would lead to baby osteomyelitis if not treated, and then later stage amputation. So when a patient's coming to your clinic, you observe callus present on the MTPJ joints or DIPJ joints, heel or heel ulcer uh, heel areas. Make sure you debride it and ask the patient to use urea-based emollients, etc. This is a case study that we have. So we had uh, we had a patient come into the clinic with onychoprophotic nails. Uh, since the nail is so big, it had it was causing massive pressure on the wound area uh, on the nail bed. And then we, our primary treatment regime was to take out the nail just to observe that there isn't any nail, uh, if there isn't any ulcer or wound form underneath the nail bed due to intensive pressure. Uh, we used a nail clipper, we used the nail drill and a surgical scissors to remove the nail. And this is what we found. So thankfully there wasn't any wound present in there and the patient and the education we gave to the patient was to when the nail grows, use a nail file to debride it and to, to stop, for, stop it from increasing forth. Use proper shoes. So when the patient's wearing shoes, not wear uh, narrow shoes, use a wide toe box, make sure, make sure it has an arch support, ankle, uh, ankle support, etc. Even for, okay, so with this patient, you can observe how the patient has clawed toes. This, might, this could be another risk factor with the patient. So if, we, if the patient's wearing narrow shoes, the DIPJ and PIPJ joints could form an ulcer due to the friction with the shoes while the patient's walking. So to reduce that, make sure the, what the, shoe, the patient's coming with the footwear, make sure the footwear has enough space in between that no friction is caused. Another treatment that you can do is a tenotomy, where you can use a syringe to, uh, to have to aspirate the uh, wound, uh, aspirate the toes, and then just have a slight sliced tendon of the uh, tendon. What it does is it releases the tendon tension, and the foot can then go from a clawed to clawed toe to a normal foot. This would not affect the patient in any way. It would not bleed, and it's a very small surgical procedure that all you all of you can adopt in your clinic practices. This is another patient that came into our clinic. So initially, the patient came in with a callus formed in the second and third plantar MTPJ. We debrided the callus and then we informed the patient to use a proper insole to reduce the formation of callus. Unfortunately, the patient, unfortunately, the patient was a bit, bit hesitant on using the insoles and refused the treatment completely. In, in the span of two weeks, this is what the case was. Because it was a massive pressure area, what happened was there was an ulcer formation with infection and lead to osteomyelitis. You can see this, the scope of inflammation and redness in there indicating, in, indicating the infection. It took approximately six to seven weeks for us to then treat the whole wound where we used dressings, we used different, we had to completely uh, offload the area. We used a TCC cast to do that. And even after that, the patient was then asked to use special shoes with special offloading devices that we had incorporated into the treatment. This is another patient. So whenever a patient comes into your clinic with callus, even if it's not their primary complaint, make sure you debride the callus. Because what can happen is, even though it looks like slight callus, when you remove it, you can see there's a massive indentation in there. If we leave it like that, it would then lead to fresh wounds, which, which would be really hard 
to uh, to treat if they have increase in torn into the bone so make sure you do full debridement another another patient we had with callus on the fifth mtpj uh, laterally when we used a tooth forceps to remove the whole area and then you can see slight infected area in there what you can do is take a culture send it to the lab just to make sure if the what infection the patient's going through use proper antibiotics do complete debridement and then educate the patient on offloading urea based treatment etc similar similar case where we had in the clinic we used a scalpel with 15 number blade debrided the whole area and then used proper dressings asked the patient to use proper footwear and then uh, another emollients so why am i emphasizing on offloading so much is because let's say if this patient came into your clinic you treated the whole bone and sent the patient back it would not help the patient because you haven't uh, you haven't eradicated the cause of the pressure ulcers what you have done is you have treated the you have treated the ulcer and that is it if we don't offload it the patient would come back to your clinic in after few months with the same problem again and then it's a chain reaction so make sure whatever wound area whatever callus pressure area you see you offload it so that we are not traumatizing the wound and we are eradicating the causes of the of the condition the patient goes with so with the diabetic patients what are the do's and the don'ts make sure the patient is wearing white socks uh, so that if the patient if a diabetic patient is if the diabetic patient is uh, make sure you wear white socks diabetic patient is bleeding you can see the bleeding in the white socks uh use white toe box shoes so the, the shoes are not narrow make sure it has a arch support use uh, ask them to buy lace up shoes so that they have an ankle support as well the, uh, when they're wearing the shoes the foot won't slide out uh, again and again wash the feet daily use a proper nail cutting method to do that do not walk barefoot um then ask the patients to do not make sure they don't take a blade and cut their own nails by themselves make sure they have a professional healthcare with it so ask them to stop smoking if they are a smoker because that contradicts their uh, it prop, uh, it constricts the vessels in the uh, diabetic patients don't wear narrow shoes make sure you don't have dry skin so always use a urea based emollient like flexitol etc don't walk bare feet because uh, since they are neuropathic when they're walking bare feet they won't realize that they cut their feet or they have we got we get so many patients who have uh, fallen bodies embedded into their uh, plantar sole just because they cannot feel it and they're walking bare feet also uh, avoid as in to avoid using a hot water or a heater during the night time in winters because what happens is they don't really know how hot it is since they can't feel it so if they if they leave it on there it can burn their skin we during the winter seasons we get so many patients with burned feet just because they are not aware and they use the hot bottles and heaters and burn their foot without even realizing it and in the morning when they wake up they realize the skin's all burned up so make sure you protect your feet wear suitable footwear uh, check your shoes for stones sharp objects make sure your feet is not uh, if there's any check your feet daily and make sure if anything unusual is present there you contact the gp all this education should be given to the patient again with the don'ts don't walk barefoot don't wear tight socks or tight shoes and that would that would cause uh, blood circulation stoppage uh, don't let your feet get dry if there's callus present make sure they get it treated etc so prevention of diabetic foot diseases the primary prevention that we are going after for diabetic patients is obviously a metabolic control uh, cessation of smoking and no successful clinical trials the second prevention that we would go after would be identifying the high risk areas of the of the feet so whatever the high risk areas is we make sure uh, we do not let it grow we stop it right there and do a proper treatment regime foot education foot care make sure the patient is aware of what the foot education we can provide them with and management of the active problems so if it's an ulceration make sure you using the proper dressing regime use whatever clinical dressings you have like collagen powder then calcium soap etc and then go forward with it um in conclusion what my key messages was be to um, choose the patients according to the level of risk if the patient has is a low risk diabetic patient then tell inform the patient of the low risk he have and how 
quickly it can grow up make sure the patient is aware of how they need to uh, control their glycemic control and then also ad also advise them to see a podiatrist or a general physician in every 6 months or annually to have a diabetic foot screening test educate those patients who educate the high risk patients inform them what can happen if they do not follow the treatment regime according to the plan it would lead to amputation Em emphasize on the problems that can happen then treat have a proper treatment regime dry skin is the most common cause of ulceration as it can uh, as the fissures can break down cause ulceration the patient would not even observe it since the patient is neuropathic and they cannot feel it so make sure you advise the patient to use emollients every day at night or in the morning and suitable if the patient cannot reach their own feet make sure you ask them to uh, maybe a family member can do it for them so overall this keeping the skin skin integrity is a massive importance to it health professionals need to be trained in the diabetic foot care and new treatment modalities should be practiced so uh, we have so many new modalities coming up like the tcpo2 hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, there are so many evidence based trials uh, occurred in back therapy prp therapy even shock wave therapy used for plantar fasciitis Achilles tendinopathy. So make sure you are up to date with these different modalities that are coming up and use them in your clinic, etc. So in conclusion, I would say most foot problems are preventable through high uh, through early identification. Identification, patient education is an essential step in treatment modalities, and all most of the foot problems are preventable if you educate the patient and the patient has a patient compliance during the treatment regime. Furthermore, I would say um, people with diabetes represent a fragile population with the COVID modality, and in this COVID era, there is a need. In this COVID era, there is a need to change our treatment strategies. Make sure the patients that are coming into the clinic are high risk patients. Uh, make sure you have a proper PPE kit. Your employees are fully educated about how to proceed with the therapies. Where in possible, use a transparent curtain dart so that you are not you're not sharing the aerosols with the patients. And I would say so that would be the reduced risk of COVID infected relation in hospital hospitalizations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Doctor Sur, uh, Doctor Dulin. This was a very nice presentation. Uh, history, history of uh, podiatry. The history of podiatry is very important. That 2400 BC, uh, it, it started. So that that's also uh, very nice. Now I introduce the uh, second, uh, the third speaker for today. She is Dr. Palvi Singh. She is one of the very renowned and uh, uh, voice coming. So she is a very renowned uh, and very uh, uh, experienced uh, physiotherapist working in Mumbai. She is the founder of Stride Fitness and Mobility Clinic in Mumbai, and she is an expert advisor on panel of Gal, Can Innovative Innovation India, Argo Monk, Foot Balance, uh, Foot Essential, and lot of other companies. She is certified in foot and ankle and lower limb biomechanics, dispensing medical grade orthotic by Vaisali Medical, and she is the manager of OrthoFit OrthoFit Physiotherapist, and she is also the president. Uh, uh, Vice President of uh, IPPA, which is the Indian Podiatry Physiotherapy um, uh, Association, which is one of the branches of Indian Podiatry Association, and we have been on long, long discussions with her to how we can start with this uh, new branch of Indian Podiatry Association, and she is one of the uh, brains behind this association, along with Shailesh, who will be the fourth speaker after her. So I invite her. and she is doing a very nice uh, and very uh, new type of uh, presentation which is shock wave therapy we all want to learn about this new therapy which is shock wave and i think all doctors dealing in diabetic shock wave care, therapy or people aware of shock wave therapy for diabetic patients with tendonitis and lot of other things are are 
enroll this type of modality into your clinic and uh, and help your patient healing with this. So, Dr. Palvi uh, Singh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Suri, for uh, giving the nice introduction. Um, Dr. Ravi, I would require help. In, in the meantime, uh, please, uh, whoever has not put their uh, name and email address and location, please put that into the chat box for your attendance. Uh, is the screen visible to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. So shockwave is a relatively a new modality in uh, uh, medical science, uh, which is widely used uh, in sports, uh, orthopedic conditions, uh, veterinary and urology conditions. Uh, in India, the usage is not as much as it should be. Uh, so let's see, let's talk about this and uh, then we can take a call whether we can include this kind of a facility at uh, our centers also. Uh, if we talk about this, um, the very early uh, occurrence of uh, ES, uh, it's called as extracorporeal shockwave therapy also. Uh, in, in 1982, it was basically used for treatment of uh, gallbladder stones and kidney stones. Uh, later on, some research has shown that it's, it has a positive effect on augmentation of bone uh, cement interference and uh, it was very good in fracture healing also. Uh, but uh, overall, as the time advances, its usage was more recognized for tendinopathy, fasciitis and soft tissue conditions also. So, um, how this works? Uh, basically, it's another sound, uh, sound wave therapy. Uh, it's a non-linear high peak pressure followed by low tensile amplitude, uh, amplitude short rise and uh, this thing so what happens in this in a very short period of time a single pulse goes from 0 to 20 megahertz and then uh, the uh, high amplitude is reached from uh, 0 to 120 megapascal uh, what happens in this thing is first when the wave hits the uh, body cavity it uh, uh, do a reversal which causes a cavitation these cavitation or gas bubble, when they implode, they again uh, generate high speed second wave of shock waves. So in comparison to ultrasound, shock wave peak pressure is thousand times greater than the peak pressure of an ultrasound wave. Uh, so the chemical effect, or you can say the biochemical effect of these things, uh, which help in getting the healing process is neovascularization. Uh, we always want our uh, uh, arteries and tendons and all those um, uh, injured structure to have a better vascularity. If the blood reaches, it does everything. Uh, it helps uh, in, in um, proliferation of stem cells uh, to the bones. Uh, it increases the osteoblastic activity of the bones. Uh, it increases leukocyte infiltration and it amplifies the synthesis, protein synthesis, uh, synthesis, so that the collagen synthesis and tissue remodeling can happen. Um, in, in short, if we say uh, shockwave energy promotes regenerate and repair the bone tendons and soft tissues. Uh, specifically, if we talk about neovascularization, there are uh, some beautiful papers on it, um, and it's like a one-day topic to discuss. Uh, Due to any physical energy, there is a, a biological response in the uh, endothelial nitric oxide synthesis. Then there is uh, vessel endothelial growth factors and proliferating cell nuclear antigen. All this thing helps in improving the blood supply and thereby it helps in bone repair, tendon repair and tissue regeneration. Another factor in which it helps is uh, by the reversal of chronic inflammation. Uh, chronic inflammation, as we all know, damage uh, the uh, area by repeated injury or uh, fall or uh, indirect traumas. So these kind of uh, acoustic waves, they help in um, activation of mast cell. Uh, the activation of mast cell uh, in return does uh, chemokinesis and cytokinesis activity, which is a, a pro-inflammatory compound and thereby reducing the inflammation in long run. So we sometimes irritate the inflammation to treat the inflammation. Um, shockwave therapy is known uh, by some, again, there's a research and paper presentation on this topic that it helps in 
uh, increasing the collagen production. Then it helps in a dissolution of uh, calcified fibroblast. Uh, in podiatry, we see a lot of patients coming to us with uh, calcaneum spur, uh, retrocalic calcaneum spur, and calcification of tendons and ligament around the feet, ankle uh, specifically. So shockwave can help in uh, precipitating that uh, calcification by softening it. And then it becomes uh, easy for the lymphatic system to drain out these uh, extra uh, bones. Uh, it also helps in uh, uh, dispersion of substance P. Substance P is basically a neurotransmitter uh, that helps uh, in reducing the nociceptive uh, fi uh, fiber. So in this, uh, we have a better feeling uh, from the pain. So many, uh, many of the time, uh, even after the first um, shockwave therapy session, patient feel their pain is gone. Um, as a physiotherapist, we work uh, extensively on trigger points. Uh, we all know how to detect a trigger point in our muscle and ligament, but sometimes uh, in a bigger muscle, it becomes very difficult uh, to palpate the trigger point and release it manually. Uh, there, there are some percussion devices also like hypervolt, um, etc., that help in uh, treating these trigger points. But uh, clinically, uh, if the trigger point is too down under, and it's been uh, embedded through uh, the fibers, then it becomes very difficult for any of the superficial modality to reach that uh, point. And uh, we cannot left the trigger points to be there for long because it restricts the blood circulation to further area. And in return, it causes metabolic crisis and increases more pressure to that point. So um, uh, with the help of focused uh, shockwave therapy, we can release these trigger points from the uh, muscles. Uh, if we talk about how it works on the nerve, uh, it has two mechanisms to work on the nerves. First is uh, hyperstimulation anesthesia. If you stimulate that, uh, the pain receptor uh, get uh, numb after uh, one or two sessions and that thereby the reduction of pain is uh, experienced by the patient. And another is pain gate theory control. Uh, so when you do this thing in long term, uh, say uh, uh, if you're doing therapy for say three to five session, uh, then you can see that uh, the pain is permanently gone for good. Uh, there are uh, four different type of uh, shockwave therapy that are used. Uh, first one is uh, electrohydraulic shockwave uh, generation that works on uh, spark gate mechanism. Uh, second is electromagnetic magnetic shockwave generation that is called as EMSG. Um, third one is piezoelectronic uh, shockwave generation. And uh, fourth one is called as radial or plastic pressure wave generation. Uh, in, in real sense, uh, this the last one is not a shockwave, but uh, usually it is marketed or uh, used as a uh, shockwave modality. Now the electrohydraulic uh, shockwave is uh, in actual the truest form of shockwave. The, uh, the higher peak pressure is uh, much more than any other uh, shockwave dispersal. But uh, the whole mechanism of uh, having this system, uh, it's not very practical for small clinics and uh, smaller setup. Uh, other one is electromagnetic shockwave. Uh, in this, the impulses are sent through an induction coil uh, generating magnetic field. So uh, uh, repulsion of the uh, metal, uh, causing the repulsion of metallic membrane. Now this acoustic uh, impulse is created repulsion and focus by an acoustic lens to form the shockwave. So this is the mechanism how it works. Uh, when you're using an electromagnetic shockwave, you require extensive water-based cooling system. Again, uh, that becomes a little difficult uh, for uh, smaller centers to have the whole setup. Uh, Orthopedic condition, ke liye, it's not that much useful. So what is mostly used, and uh, in my personal opinion, one of the best devices that I have personally uh, hold is the piezoelectronic uh, shockwave therapy. So piezo is basically, uh, there is a concave uh, 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 surface in which there are uh, a single layer or uh, uh, double layered uh, piezo elements are being placed. Now, uh, these piezo elements, when they are activated, they do precise uh, pulse creation. And then you can do targeted and focal treatment with that. Um, so, just to give you like a, uh, 
visual uh, of this uh, system. This is one of the uh, system that I have used and uh, it, it is handy. You can keep it in the clinic. It comes with a, a monitor in which you can do the setting as per the, because there are preset programs also that you can use. And uh, for the treatment area, depending on the inflammation and your clinical diagnosis, you can preset the examination and you can do that uh, the treatment. Uh, there are two, three different kind of attachments to help doing this thing. Uh, it can be focused, linear, or uh, planar. Uh, focused are used more, most of the time around the joint areas and uh, everything. Uh, the linear ones, uh, apart from podiatry, that is much more used in uh, urology and other condition. And uh, again, linears are used for smaller uh, area, the planar ones. So this is uh, the filament which is inside. Um, uh, all these are the piezo, the small, small uh, dots that you're seeing, are these are the piezo elements. So these crystal, um, some what generate around 5 million uh, shocks. Uh, in a lifetime, then it needs to be replaced. Uh, for a normal human, uh, you are not supposed to have more than 100 to 200 uh, shock waves uh, per session. So the treatment protocol is uh, divided as per the joint area. So simultaneously, even if you are treating two part, you have to divide the number of shocks between those two parts. You cannot go excessive on it. Uh, the radial one is basically like a jackhammer kind of a thing, not too great as a shock wave. Uh, their maximum penetration is only 5 millimeter. Uh, the common condition that we can treat uh, with uh, uh, extracorporeal shock wave, uh, we can go by it. Uh, calcaneal or retrocalcaneal spur. As we have discussed earlier, that uh, it helps in decalcification. So these kind of spurs when we are seeing, uh, we basically very first time when we are seeing a patient, what we try to do is we try to do a biomechanical assessment, try to identify if there are some muscle, uh, muscular tightness which is causing extra pressure onto the calcaneum and we can try offloading it uh, with the help of uh, insoles and orthotic. Uh, second line of treatment is uh, we uh, wait for it and see whether the pain and symptoms down. But if in, in case this person is an active sports person and uh, they want to continue their activity with the spur causing them on and off pain and a dull aching pain is very irritating. So shockwave come handy in such condition and within two to three sessions only these kind of a condition can be taken care of and permanently the pain can be reduced. Uh, chronic tendopathy. Um, we also call it as echelodynia. Now, what happens with the uh, Achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy is um, the pain is usually long running. So uh, as a physiotherapist, when a patient comes to you, you try to do uh, calf release, you try to teach them calf stretching protocol, you strengthen the calf, you try to work on the tibialis anterior to compensate for the uh, calf tightness and everything. But these patients keep on coming back to it. One more thing that work in these kind of a case is uh, PRP therapy. If uh, the person come to you in early stage of first three months, PRP and other therapies work very well. Uh, chronic pains are difficult to treat with uh, any of uh, shoe modification exercises or other therapy uh, venture. And then uh, the other limitation is to go for surgery. So before surgery, again, uh, shockwave can be one of the modality that can be tested and uh, between Three to five or sometime um, uh, six to seven sessions are needed. Uh, the session are not like uh, today, tomorrow and uh, uh, day after. Uh, usually after one session there has to be like a week gap, uh, five to ten days sometime uh, and then you see the effect on it. Now whenever the person takes the shockwave therapy, uh, it's much easier for you to understand whether you're doing it right. Uh, similarly as trigger point, when you keep the probe of uh, shockwave at the point of, uh, so you do the same way palpation and try to identify which is the most uh, tender part of the tendon uh, which you want to focus and when you keep the uh, shockwave uh, probe onto that tendon you will see a reaction on the patient face also. There is a discomfort they feel, uh, sometimes there is an increased pain that they feel but after the end of the session they feel okay the pain is gone. Now after two, three days, they are still say 48 hours, they can have some uh, kind of uh, spasm or you can say DOMS that they can experience because of the session, which is normal. Um, 
another thing as physios and podiatrists we see very often is uh, medial tibial stress syndrome uh, similarly in this uh, there is um, the typical feature if you see these patient come to you are basically long distance runner ultra runners and all and uh, they experience uh, pain in the shin area uh, after say 5 to 10 kilometers of running initially they can start the run but in mid mid, mid of the run they start getting these pain uh, other sports uh, these uh, problems or injuries are common uh, are kicking games uh, martial arts and all mmd when people do jump and these days people are into a uh, lot of functional training so when they jump on a box and jump down they experience this pain on landing so again in this condition a shock wave work very uh, well for them then um, there are some insertional pain uh, sometimes we say ki oh this is growing pain for adult uh, athletes and all and uh, sometimes it comes in uh, later age also because of uh, constant usage lack of exercise sitting in long uh, position sitting for long hours in a uh, same position causes uh, decreased vascularization of uh, the tendons and ligaments at the uh, attachment so in this case uh, as we know that one of the effect of uh, shock wave is neovascularization so we can reinstate the blood supply towards the area which is having poor blood flow and thereby decreasing the pain um, jumpers knee is again one of the common sports injury and problem that you will see so again um, because of the over inflammation of the patellar tendon you feel the pain in the anterior aspect uh, mostly pain, pain is on the landing so again uh, in in many of the time i have seen people uh, leaving their game because of this snagging pain uh, in the knee uh, so better than that is to try something different uh, instead of exercising stretching and modification though all are needed together with the uh, shock wave the results can be much faster uh, hip pain at all ages are becoming very common uh, i see young adult also having a lot of hip pain these days uh you need to do a lot of differential diagnosis to rule out uh, um, limb length discrepancy and any other injuries uh, sometimes due to weak core muscle and weak glute muscles also the hip pains are there so after a thorough investigation you can find out what are the main and root cause of uh, hip pain uh, hip pain and um, uh, injuries uh, to the bone through fall Uh, in a fracture and all is also common so in uh, older age sometimes the surgery is not a very viable option and uh, if there is a minor crack or um, minor injury so in in geriatric patient shock wave can come very handy to uh, see if we can regenerate the muscle around and revascularize the bone to have a better healing uh, it it shows in research that 79% of the necrosis uh, patient have improved circulation because of uh shock wave therapy so it's a uh, paper presented by some russian uh, people and uh, it really works uh, there are some contraindications for uh, shock wave uh, uh, therapy um, majorly during pregnancy it is not used cancer coagulation injuries uh, if there is a brain or a spinal cord injury you don't use it um yeah, typically uh, we have discussed that we are using it for uh, chronic cases uh, here but uh, it can be used in acute cases also uh, but acute soft tissue in, uh, infection or uh, uh, bone injuries you should not use it uh, there are some relative con contraindications are also there uh, say if the cancer is at a distant part and uh, you want to treat the distant part you can treat that but you have to do the precaution that the uh, number of shock waves are not too high uh again uh, tendonitis and all uh, if uh, the joint is not stable then ideally you should not use it first try to strengthen and stabilize the joint and see if uh, the patient can take the uh, wave uh, because it's it, it it's really painful uh, at some time um then uh, some side effects that you can see uh, like other therapy also if you are doing a muscle release or something you can see some critical edema hematomas that can follow uh swelling as a secondary inflammation can happen and sometimes the patient have uh, more symptoms uh, like the pain they were saying that it was 5 or 6 before and now it is 7 or 8 then uh, these are very common uh, to happen and it can happen with any other therapy also so uh, best advice at this point is to do cryotherapy and take a muscle relaxant if need be 
So that's it from my side. Um, hope uh, it's not too boring. Yeah, it, this uh, presentation by Dr. Palvi was very nice, and there are a lot of indications for shockwave therapy. We were initially thinking that uh, plantar fasciitis, tendonitis, and all the tendo uh, tendopathies, uh, you can use this therapy, and it's a very good uh, uh, unit which you can have it for your clinics. There are a lot of questions on shockwave therapy from the audience, so we'll take these questions uh, at the last. And now we have uh, Dr. Shalay. Uh, I invite Dr. Rajneesh Saxena uh, on the podium. We'll introduce to Dr. Shalay uh, uh, Chotala. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambar. First of all, I am I congratulate uh, congratulate Miss uh, Dr. Pallavi for his for her nice presentation. Now our next speaker is Dr. Shalay Chotala. He is podiatrist and uh, he had done his study from New Zealand. At present, he is president Indian Podiatry Association, Gujarat chapter. He is a, a diabetic foot specialist there. And also he is a lower limb biomechanic specialist. He is at present working and attached with Dr. Chotala's Shona Hospital Surat, Jeevan Jyoth Hospital Surat, and Surat Podiatry and Diabetic Foot Care Center. He is visiting podiatrist at many Good hospital across the Gujarat. I welcome Dr. Chotala. He will give lecture on podiatry, a multidisciplinary medicine field. Welcome to Dr. Chotala. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, nice words. Uh, actually, the uh, previous uh, speaker has uh, uh, taken uh, uh, much time, so I, without wasting the time, I uh, will uh, start the um, my presentation and. Uh, yeah, uh, the, as, uh, today's topic is uh, uh, the podiatry is the multidisciplinary medicine field. So as uh, Gurlin, Dr. Gurlin said that it's an ancient branch of the medicine and we must know uh, what podiatrists can do. So podiatrist is the specialized medical doctor who can assess and uh, treat the foot uh, and ankle joint problems, which uh, would be the, either in the conservative uh, point of view or the surgical point of view in nature. So uh, many uh, conditions, uh, we can do uh, the protocol for the conservative management and uh, many of them are the surgical procedures. So know uh, 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 when to see a podiatrist. Uh, this is some pictureized uh, that uh, podiatrist can do. And uh, the next one is the categorize the, I categorize the uh, thing that podiatrist uh, mainly uh, focusing on the conditions like uh, first of all, the ulceration, non-healing foot wound, and the foot infection, which has required the antibiotic treatment, uh, which can be the fungal nails or any ingrown toenails with the inflammation and infections. And the another thing is the painful cones, painful large area of the calluses. Podiatrists can uh, uh, exit it and uh, treat, uh, and uh, uh, they can, I mean, they participate in the that the prevent amputation protocol. Uh, as Dr. Suri sir. Uh, uh, mainly a couple of times said and uh, uh, he said always that uh, uh, cons and callus if we can prevent them on the first stage we can prevent amputation in later on so this is the first and foremost thing to uh, do all of the health practitioners to prevent I mean, the, ah, the cons and calluses. second thing uh, neuropathy is also there there is some peripheral arterial disease also there uh, some inflammatory arthritis there diabetes uh, which can lead the moderate and high risk uh, uh, foot risk uh, classification. Yeah. Some foot ulcers also there. Um, diabetic foot ulcers uh, are referred straight to the diabetic foot clinic. As I said, uh, some neurological disorders uh, like uh, myasthenia graves, uh, some uh, muscle uh, weakness, uh, some uh, foot related bowel mechanics problem in neuro. Uh, neurological disorder also can be treated by the podiatrist. And uh, as we know, some uh, undergoing uh, chemotherapy, if patient uh, underwent uh, chemotherapy, then also some neurological uh, deficit is there. Uh, so the foot is also involved in that manner, and we can treat uh, uh, conservatively or some uh, with the help of some medicine. This is some uh, primary indication and secondary indication uh, for the orthopedic conditions like uh, LX valgus, LX varus, any biomechanical knee problems, any biomechanical back problems. 
uh, as we all suffer uh, any of them uh, as a doctor and as a normal person we are uh, facing lots of uh, this problem nowadays so nobody uh, i think i can say nobody because uh, when when i look at the foot of the patient uh when uh, when i saw the multiple files on my table uh, before coming to me uh, patient is complaining uh, uh, that uh, this time uh, before two months this is there after that also this is there but uh, when i conclude the patient's uh, opinion i mean a patient's uh, consultation uh, i must uh, say to the other doctors and our field uh, uh, our field uh, field fellow that uh, uh whenever you look at the foot just consider other problems of the patient as well sometimes patient has a knee problems patient has a back problem so it's all related to foot because foot is the pillar of the body so if we uh, just look at the foot and uh, we ignore the other condition uh, that way also patient is suffer more in the uh, in, in the meantime so uh, as per my opinion we have to conclude all the posture of the patient and whether uh, they are diabetic or non diabetic whether they are a sports person or whether a uh, patient has any any problem related to food uh, i will cover in the next slide so this is the basic uh, concept uh, for making this uh, ippa that uh, we can cover all the aspect of the foot and ankle uh, uh, with the help of other uh, field of medical field uh, which we are uh, i mean practicing uh, regularly so the, uh, those are some uh, uh, orthopedic conditions now coming to the primary indications for uh, ankle and foot uh, none other than diabetic foot ulcer diabetic neuropathy some uh, we have a, a neuropathic problem so flat arch high as feet over pronated or supinated foot sometimes uh, uh, we have getting uh, we, we are getting the amputation amputee patient so amputation of, of foot is there some uh, some uh, as a uh, dr pallavi and uh, other fellow uh, other speaker said that any uh, uh, orthopedic condition like plantar fasciitis uh, we are uh, uh, getting the patient uh, from the uh, that gynecologist uh, point of view patient uh, suffering from swelling on the uh, third trimester of the pregnancy so some foot problems is there so we are treating that uh, uh, that patient as well achilles, achilles tendinitis arch pain strain ankle joint arthritis rheumatoid arthritis and sports athletes foot bunion is there callus cons clotos hematos those are the common problems of the ankle and foot heel spurs also uh, we are facing uh, morton's neuroma we are treating metatarsalgia so according to uh, the uh, uh, podiatry uh, that medical field we are treating lots of uh, foot and ankle uh, uh, that uh, conditions in the in the row so this uh, picture says uh, some uh, blisters or an inflammation any arch pain complain if patient is complaining of foot pain those are the uh, uh, those are the symptoms and those are the uh, the treatment protocol for that and uh, some orthopedic conditions like heel pain lx valgus uh, any uh, any nail problems also there that we can treat and sometimes the sports person also feeling the uh, foot cramps on the regular basis so we can have a good uh, uh, advantage to uh, tell them to how to play how to run uh, that is also the part of the uh, the podiatry field uh, now i coming to the podiatry team work uh, as we all know it is a team work podiatry can uh, include each and every uh, uh, field of the medicine uh that way uh, this is the some uh, paper presentation on on written uh, that podiatry can uh, uh, podiatry can collaborate uh, each and every branch of the uh, medicine first of all the orthopedic condition as i said uh, lots of conditions for foot and ankle in orthopedic in general surgery also in plastic surgery also uh, in some trauma centers also podiatry can work because uh, uh, when trauma is there some uh, foot injuries or uh, amputation sometimes are needed so along with the plastic surgeon or general surgeon or orthopedician we can have a, a good uh, team work uh, in the trauma centers some vascular and endovascular surgeons also uh, need the podiatry services uh, uh, even neurosurgeon and neurophysicians also uh, need that uh, some pediatrician uh, also need that because uh, we are facing uh, we are getting more cases on uh, child so in school going uh, children's uh, lots of flat feet hyperpronation Uh, that uh, that way uh, we are uh, getting the uh, patients from the pediatricians also 
some gynecologists, as I said, some uh, 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 trimester in the second or third trimester, uh, some food changes also uh, rule out by the gynecologists, and they can also refer to us. Some sports condition, not sp uh, some. Uh, every sports uh, have to, uh, I mean, uh, have to uh, fit uh, foot and ankle. So sports, uh, no sports is uh, maximum sports is, uh, uh, I mean, played by the foot and ankle, strong foot and ankle. Uh, uh, by the sports person. So this is also the vast field uh, uh, related to podiatry uh, as uh, none other than endocrinologists and diabetologists, uh, maximum work from them. Rheumatologists also some rheumatic conditions like arthritis, uh, some flowing toes of the, just because of the hyperuresemia. So we can have a, a good teamwork with the rheumatologists as well. Some physiotherapists, uh, this is the best branch uh, uh, nowadays to deal with the uh, physiotherapy and collaborate with the podiatry services. So uh, this is also a good idea. The second last is the PNO, prosthesis and orthotics. Uh, when uh, some amputation is occur, uh, we need the prosthetics and uh, good orthotics to make a, a good uh, rehabilitation work. And along with that, uh, the last field, uh, I can say obesity. When patient is obese, uh, maximum uh, pressure uh, is on the knee and the foot. So uh, with the diabetes, if patient is obese, then uh, if, uh, Dr. Arun Mahiya sir already explained the arches and mechanics of the foot, they completely disturb. And uh, the uh, charcoal foot is coming. Uh, nowadays, uh, it is more coming case because of the obese patient. When you look at the charcoal foot, you, you, you do. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Thank you, Dr. Chodala. It was a very nice presentation, and really have to see that Sunitri is dealing with all the uh, most of the. Okay, can we mute? Can, can the all the audience mute? mute and... Hello. Hello. So hello. Hello. As Dr. Uh, Chutta has said, sir. that podiatry is linked with most of the field dealing with uh, podiatry, like it is filled with general surgery, with plastic surgery, with uh, vascular surgery, and all physicians, most of the sports medicine, and physiotherapy, and these educators, or paramedics. So, all the in all fields have to work together if we have to get best results for our patient. Very important thing is that globally and internationally, whoever pay, the hospitals have podiatry and vascularity together, along with physician, along with therapy, along with the, in those department or those hospitals, the amputation rate is literally negligible. We have seen in international hospital where people are working tandem in together, there the amputation rate is literally negligible. So we have to work together. And very important in foot care is that we should have a full system. Very good reference should be there among ours in the in the same city or in the same hospital. You can take help from vascular surgery. There's a neuro sir. You should take the help of vascular plastic surgeon when you have to get drafting and other things to be done. Flaggies. You need a radiologist to check for um, uh, all the radiographs, CT angiography, MR angiography, or scan of the fluid. To look for ischemia or sharp cuts, you need a diabetologist or a physician. It's very important when you need to have a good control in your patient dealing with care, and you need to have a strong paramedical. Field. Paramedical field consists of diabetes, um, male nurse or female nurse and dressers. These things are very important because we know that you and me we don't much have time. You need people to do dressing. Doctor Amar, I want to, uh, Doctor Amar. Hello, yes, yes, Dr. Amar, yes. I want to know something regarding the education of paramedic. How IPA uh, educate all the paramedic to prevent uh, amputation? Okay. How can uh, IPA Dr. take initiative? Yes, you have asked a very good question and this, this question is there on the screen also. One of the doctors again have asked this. Indian Podiatry Association has started, has is doing a fellowship in diabetic food management. And this is an online course which runs for about six months to nine months. And these are mainly for the doctors, the MBBS and above level. And then we do a fellowship. Two, two batches we have already done in Indian Podiatry Association. 
coming down to medics we are now devise a course which is again an online course which any paramedics can do either a diabetes educator a male nurse a female nurse or even a any podiatrist is there can do and even physiotherapist can also do this course this is covering six chapters in foot care uh, dealing into for paramedics and then there will be a five days of um, uh, five days of observation the observation will be in delhi in bangalore in uh, ajmer in karnataka and kanpur and also we'll start in surat also so these five places five days observership and ticket course will be given this is for all the paramedics any doctor in this you can send your paramedic to this online you can do this course so this is available and what and what will be the co uh, cost of this course cost of this course is rupees 25000 indian rupees a uh, very yeah. very economical course 25000 very yes very economical Yes. Any other question, Doctor Rajneesh? Uh, you have it on your slides. Actually, sir, uh, there are so, so many questions for, uh, for from audience. One question for Doctor Maya. Yeah. What are the most common? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Arun. One question for Doctor Arun. Yeah. What are yes. the most common offloading tool available in India at present? And from oh. there. The diabetologist or podiatrist can purchase, can manage these two beers and insoles. Yeah, when we say the offloading, uh, the most uh, the gold standard is the total cost, to, total contact cost. However, considering the uh, the economical aspect as well as the the patient's point of view, we get various types of insoles and the offloading devices are available. If you look at the footwear. footwears like now uh, started with the mcp footwear or various type of plastizos can be used and also the various offloading devices are available in the market and these offloading devices we divide commonly divide into the four foot offloading or sometimes the hind foot offloading or maybe related to the arch correction or sometimes in the patients with the char coat can also use the rocker bottom type of offloading these all the various uh, common types of offloading are available however the most important prescription should be based on the clinical evaluation of the patient each patient will have their own uh, different types of clinical manifestation so that according to the individual need we need to assess them and then provide the an appropriate offloading sir in a small town no facility of uh, plantar foot pressure assessment is there so which type yeah. of footwear or offloading devices can be advised to the patient the yeah, one simple method like a harris mat is available it's a very cost effective uh, tool for assessing the plantar pressure even in the community level or even in the uh, small centers so that helps okay. in understanding the plantar pressure distribution so that is a one yes, method okay. by which we can evaluate the second point as i said clinically we can assess one or two important parameter like first ray commonly all the physician can able to assess the first ray assessment or the windlass me mechanism or even also we can look at the clinically look at the changes in the arch so accordingly then we can able to provide the offloading tools or the appropriate footwear thank you thank you yes that, that's a very good answer to this i i have a question from very uh, good question from dr ekta she is from ghaziabad she is asking that how many dietary colleges are there for india this is for dr gulleen how many podiatry colleges are there for india and what are the podiatry education models available for our country uh, that's a very good question so at the moment in india there are no there are no in in india there aren't any podiatry universities at the moment so if someone wants to pursue podiatry what they have to do is they can go to uh, usa where they have a dpm course so it's a diabetic podiatric medicine course which is approximately 4 years uh, of length or they can go to uk or australia where they have a bsc in podiatry if they uh, if the doctors have completed the mbbs as dr suri had explained earlier they can join the ipa ipa dpm uh, diabetic foot care medical course which is a fellowship program for a few weeks 
or what they can also do is they can either go to uk or australia to do a pre registration course which is a one year course where they can do a fellowship in podiatry and work shadow some of the podiatrists but at the moment in india there aren't any colleges or universities providing podiatry yeah that's yeah a, that's a that that's a good answer to this if you have to uh, start education in podiatry you can do that before your mbbs or you can even do after your mbbs you have to go to any of the cities in australia us or us and even if you have done mbbs then you can do this fellowship online fellowship of diabetic food management from indian podiatry association you can complete this online course then you can do observership at two or three places designated as given on the ippa uh, website and then you do a uh, fellowship certification is given to you and then you can also start to practice in podiatry this is all and uh, we have a question uh, uh, here for dr arun maya sir what are the new treatment modalities available for plantar fascia this is by dr ravi from kanpur what are the new treatment modalities available for plantar fasciitis or uh, heel pain uh, it's a good question sir actually even uh, the diabetic foot patients are also most commonly manifest with the plantar fasciitis or the calcaneal spur or other uh, related issues and most commonly also they suffer from the neuropathic neuropathic pain i speak only uh, i just i wanted to highlight non pharmacological approach at today's discussions i would like to highlight more on the various modalities are available and its evidence have been established across the globe one example uh, dr pallavi had already highlighted about the shock wave therapy even in our center we have been using the shock wave therapy especially when there is a tendinopathy uh, with the diabetic neuropathy with the tendinopathy this shock wave therapy gives an excellent result in addition to that the neuropathic patients we can use the low level laser therapy the class 3b and 3a and class 3b laser it's a therapeutic laser and uh, this uh, even in our center we have conducted and as well as we published about more than 15 uh, uh, quality papers in the international journal what we did is we to establish the evidence along with the clinical parameters we have taken various uh, biochemical parameters when we are treating with the laser most commonly called the neuropathic specific markers anolase and other markers have been analyzed pre and post and we got an excellent result one of the common uh, uh, the physiological effect is it improves the microcirculation in addition to that other modalities conservative modalities like uh, you can go with the other electrophysical agents can be used for management of the patient and as a preventive measure it's important for us to provide an appropriate uh, uh, offloading devices or the offloading footwear thereby during the ambulation you can reduce the abnormal pressure thereby you can also reduce the pain i just restricted only to the non pharmacological management of the patient and i wanted to highlight here also with the laser we have a randomized control trial it's an ongoing trial and patients those who are started with the the pregabalin or other neuropathy following them from the last one year and with the irradiation of the laser once we improve the micro circulation the intensity of the pain the severity of the pains have drastically come down and they have also been tapered from these uh, neuropathic specific medications also thank you sir thank you thank is... you sir for uh, thank you sir for the nice is uh, the uh, question how ippa will help physicians who are dealing with uh, diabetic foot ulcers how can we improve i think uh, dr shailesh you are mute dr chotala unmute yourself unmute yes yes sir sorry uh, yes as uh, i heard the question uh, ippa formation body uh, will help to get the uh, right things done for the diabetic foot ulcer sometimes we suffer that uh, uh, on the periphery area and the rural area uh, no podiatrists or no surgeons is going so 
if we train the paramedics we can have a good advantage to uh, uh, the fulfill the uh, uh, prevent amputation goal uh, and uh, some dressing techniques some uh, uh, the debridement some uh, foot care techniques we can teach to the paramedics and then that way we can uh, have the good advantage and the physiotherapy is the uh, last month i have uh, email from the uh, usa that uh, that uh, uh, pta that pt physical therapy association also tie up with the wound care uh, facilities so on the covid era also uh, no physician no surgeon is uh, or no registered nurse even going to work for the diabetic foot ulcer treatment so that way physical therapy is also a good doctor and a good uh, 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 doctor of the team that uh, that can work they can work uh, along with the all the as i said all the faculties all the super specialty field along with the uh, diabetic foot care management so i think uh, yeah education of education, education of all the members of ippa with the help of indian priority association and all the speakers and all faculties are important for uh, um, improving the education status of the uh, all the members now next question for dr arun maya dr arun do you have any courses in biomechanics in manipal university presently we are not offering any uh, uh, extended course in the biomechanics however it is a okay. part of the curriculum we have in the near future we have a plan for starting the the certification programs certificate program as well as the fellowship in the biomechanics also we are just okay. working on that but at present it is a, uh, we, we don't have okay, okay. there is a question for doctor uh, there is a question for doctor palvi singh uh, actually there are multiple of, of questions so i'll join uh, two or three questions what is the cost of shock wave therapy in india and are there any companies uh, which are available here in india uh, so there are uh, two three different systems uh, in india there are some uh, indian players also which i am making the one i showed you is a german company uh, us based and second uh, is uh, erectile dysfunction yeah, yeah. so yes uh, what what you said sir uh, uh, what is the cost of shock wave therapy uh, unit in india and mm -hmm. uh, any companies here where we can get this unit there are three doctors dr murthy and that is dr anand suri there are lot uh, three four doctor have asked this question and so, another so second I, I, I you can, can answer this then i'll ask uh, huh. you answer this yeah so there are two three companies which are making i can give you contact for the pictures that i have used it's a german company the pizzo short way what i have seen in theirs is very good and i have personally used it so i can vouch for it Uh, the system you can talk to the supplier and the cost effectiveness of it. Uh, a good shock wave, uh, if you see, can go from twenty five to fifty lakh rupees also. So it depends on uh, the quality and the number of shocks they uh, promise you to give. Uh, the Indian versions are cheaper, uh, but uh, then the durability sometimes is an issue. After two years, three years, they don't work. So if, if it is not uh, sending the shock, then it's of no use. depend on that so any good supplier can give you uh, this machine it's widely and, used in uh, australia can i just I add in australia so there i used it so it was can i good. yeah can i just add to dr uh, yes. pallavi yeah. actually yes. uh, as uh, dr pallavi mentioned it presently german or in the europe the shock wave therapies are uh, have been uh, more popularized but in india yeah. to our knowledge chennai based one uh, technomed yeah. electronics Yeah. they have started with the uh, shock yeah. therapy and it's costing about 5 lakhs almost uh, the one uh, the yeah, one, uh, one fifth of the cost what uh, we are yes. getting from the international market yeah. and we have lgo i saw we have lgo and lgo also, also, also sir sir kodiya is very costly marketing kodiya is have not started with the therapeutic thing kodiya is and diabetic okay. foot care they are focusing only on the diagnostic Oh, they are not yes, started yes, with yes. any therapeutic, therapeutic modalities yeah yeah they for the treatment purpose they are not companies yeah. Yeah. yeah they are promising so, okay. and also and i saw some question some questions on laser also somebody had asked i think i saw in the screen yeah. and even yes. yeah. Uh, yeah uk based companies thor laser is one of the international uh, uh, 
reputed company which provides the laser even in india there are two companies to my knowledge that one once again technomed electronics cost is about 3 to 4 lakhs even 2 to 4 lakhs is the range and one more bangalore based company is also started with the laser now but all other dealers are focusing on the international uh, uh, equipment they are all the suppliers rather than the manufacturers yes okay and, and whoever wants to have the details of the companies what you can do at, uh, for the for the audience you can send us an email send it to uh, dr palvi or dr maya sir shailesh or myself and then we can send you the details for the company dr yes, sir, yes, sir. wanted to add yes. when you showed in one of your slides that uh, different type of shock wave therapies like piezoelectric or ballistic as a diabetic foot specialist now any uh, there's a surgeon who's working in a say prestige care hospital we have a lot of wound so, care patients other patients with 34 lot of uh, uh, physiotherapy problems how to decide uh, the shock wave therapy like ballistic one or piezoelectric uh, uh, your comments on that so um the factor is the end result will gonna be same the comfort is important so the piezo one if you use there is not too much of a noise that is coming all the other equipments when you are using there is a big, big humming noise comes and if you are treating a patient uh, one after another it becomes very difficult to handle those machines while giving the shock also your hand will also take the vibration so the piezo ones are more delicate and uh, good uh, again that piezo ones is a uh, little expensive and not easily available uh, i have seen the technomed system also and uh, so what happened is uh, in india we are not using it that often so we don't have much of a case study to compare with but uh, when i was studying about it and i was noting it down so i think like for uh, uh, grade one ulcers it can be a very booming uh, thing uh, a non invasive method without much of a, a hassle and the patient don't have to come on a regular basis so if we put uh, shock wave therapy and uh, uh, proper supportive shoes and orthotics the patient can have a better result uh, because these diabetic people they are very afraid of going for surgeries and there are always complication to go about with that so it can okay. work well for the surgeons also okay thank you so much thank you so much for a nice answer dr palvi there's another question for you does shock therapy uh, help in patients with erectile dysfunction ed there's a yes. question uh, from dr murthy from telang uh, he is also the IPA president from uh, uh, Talanda chapter of Indian Podiatry Association, and he is a very yeah. active member of Indian Podiatry Association. So he has asked this question: Shock wave Sir, therapy for uh, erectile dysfunction. So uh, shock wave therapy was originally for urology cases, as I mentioned. Uh, it really worked very well for ED. Uh, the linear uh, probe that you have seen in the presentation, the second one. is used for ed and uh, for pel pelvic floor uh, related issue also it can be used but uh, shock wave has been proven as the one of the best tool for uh, ed so okay that's that's another question sorry dr palvi actually yes sir yes can sir. i just add sir one point shall i add sir yes yes I yes add in to dr palvi what she said actually the concept of uh, a concept of uh, shock wave therapy was introduced to remove the renal calculi and yeah. especially on the uh, yes. urogenital yes. 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 system it was started with that yes. research yes. then it is extended to the musculoskeletal research so definitely it works in the area of the uh, erectile dysfunctions or the yeah. uh, urogenital yeah. issues also sir yeah so in bombay there are two center which are using the shock wave and uh, they are urologist uh, who are using it for ed and all other Okay, but uh, Dr. Puri, there's another uh, there's another question by Dr. Sir, up mute again. Hello, hello, Dr. Palvi. My question is: Can shockwave therapy help in neuropathy in the diabetic patients? So, if we use shockwave therapy, will it help with the neuropathy present in the diabetic patients in any way? 
so um, again, when I was uh, reading about this, uh, it shows two things. Uh, one uh, that we discussed is neovascularization. Secondary, uh, second thing was the pain get uh, stimulation. Now, uh, as we are talking about neuropathy, we know the limitation. And uh, in the previous lecture also, we were talking about it. So um, neuropathy, as we say, once the nerve is damaged, it cannot regenerate. So we focus on uh, providing as much strength to the muscle and improve the circulation to the area. Um, thereby, the patient can take more load onto the feet. So uh, the altered sensation like numbness, tingling, burning, uh, in some cases, it can give a uh, little relief. But to be, um, now this is shock wave cannot be uh, overall the body. So the effect can be limited. Uh, we are more uh, having good results in focused shockwave rather than generalized shockwaves. So it's difficult to compare uh, and promote it for uh, uh, neuropathies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palvi, for the nice answer. Uh, I have a question for Gurleen. Uh, there's a very nice question from Dr. Ahmed. Ahmed is from Calcutta and he's also one of the IPA life member of, uh, from Calcutta and he has a diabetic foot care center over there. He is asking the question that is podiatry department a part of surgery department or medicine department? Very good question. As we say that uh, podiatry is a multidisciplinary and we all have to work together. So if you look, actually, let her answer that question because she has worked in Northampton in US and a lot of international hospitals in podiatry. So we sometimes see that podiatry should be part and parcel linked with the surgery department or medicine department. Gulin, your answer to this. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Singh. So, uh, so what, uh, I have what I have heard is that is podiatry, podiatry is not just a medicine or medicine physician uh, department, uh, department or it is not just, just, not just surgical, surgical department. department. I think it's an, MDD, think it's an MDD, MDD team where you have podiatric surgeons as well as podiatrists together. together. So, in so in in over if you come to a podiatry physician clinic, you see problems like carriers or you can do low it's like in like England but then again, again, for any instruction surgeries or let's say a shark or a surgery or masses like amputation and stuff, that would come in a surgical injury in the podiatry. So I think it's an overall combination of both and also an input of working alongside with diabetics, vascular surgeons, plastic surgeons, etc. That's how I work. There is a lot of echo. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank, 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 uh, Dr. Gulin for that answer. We have a question from Raka uh, from Raipur. He is asking contraindication for shock wave and laser. I think you have already uh, come into your slides. So if you have very quickly, if you want to answer that, and also there's another question uh, for Dr. Ma Ma Maya sir. That please guide where can we get non pharma tools for treating neuropathy and non specific pain? I think all of you have answered that. Uh, where right. to get laser and non, uh, non pharmacological treatment for that? So, Dr. Raka, Dr. Maya has already answered your question. Looking at the contraindication for shock wave therapy. Uh, so, major contraindication that we discussed were pregnancy cancer and uh, some acute inflammation. Uh, for all of you, I will share the PDF of the presentation on the group so that you can read more about it. And if you need any further uh, explanation of these things, because each and every slide is based on some pa uh, paper presentation and some research was done. So if you need yeah. any further explanation, I can uh, share you those also. Okay. Yeah, you can send the one slide point, to him. Sir, one, co one contraindication specific to the today's discussion is a charcoal foot is not indicated for shockwave therapy. Yes. When yes, there is yes. a bony was, derangement was... is there, yes, sir. Yes. Never, so never use shockwave therapy, sharp or support. So sure. any unilateral hot support, if you have a unilateral hot foot, swollen foot, never try to use shockwave therapy because that will really destroy the architecture of the foot. There's another question for Dr. Shalai. Shalai Chotala, what is the cost of custom made or uh, custom made shoes or soles for a patient suffering with diabetic foot ulcer uh, dr uh, anand suri from hyderabad 
He has asked this question. Yes, what are the costs for custom made soles or custom made shoes? Uh, as uh, uh, you, uh, we all know that sir, in the slides you are also presenting some footwear. But in my center, in Surat center, we are making uh, very cost effective. It is starting just from the thousand rupees, just because uh, we have to reach the periphery of the uh, metro city. So just thousand rupees a pair. It is custom made and very reliable and very worth to uh, worth for the diabetic foot patient. We can give the offloading techniques inside the uh, footwear, and if patients need it for a long time, then also we can uh, uh, give the good products uh, in future also. So the uh, as per the, the uh, Anand story, sir, the price is very effective. Uh, in the market, it is uh, I mean just the normal uh, diabetic footwear is fifteen hundred rupees. So we are giving the thousand rupees for custom made. If if we get the uh, the measurement or any any data of the patient's foot, I can make it here and I can send you uh, whatever the region of the India. So the, it is starting from thousand rupees to uh, just fifteen hundred to two thousand, not more than that. So it's a very cost effective in the market, and we have the option for uh, sleepers, chappals, sandals, shoes, everything. So and uh, we have the PNO department as well. So sometimes if amputation is there, then also we can have a good biomechanical footwear or any biomechanical device for the patient. So it will yes. uh, give the re, uh, it, it will not give the reoccurrence of the ulcer. That that is our motto of the center. So, so no, one, that's a very one thing, good uh, one thing, uh, for that. Uh, Amar, Ravi, um, you can comment on yeah. yeah. Basically, a few things I was noticing. Uh, Dr. Pallavi, good presentation on what you said. And um, uh, regarding uh, uh, the shockwave therapy, I think uh, biofilm uh, destruction would be very much helpful with shockwave therapy. And regarding uh, uh, the uh, role of uh, multiple extenders of uh, wound care delivery, uh, like Dr. Chotara was talking earlier, uh, it, it comes to a point where uh, everybody, like, in the villages or whoever have to be given um, uh, tools. Say, uh, Santosh was just mentioning about transportation. So transportation is a huge thing. And when you, when you don't want people to walk and you are asking them to come to the clinic, it is going to be a problem. So idea of using technology and uh, that, that is what we have to work and we'll, as a part of IPA, we we'll bring that solution and uh, uh, basically, I think uh, at the end of the day, it just comes down to knowledge transfer and learning from each other. And this has been a good meeting. Unless you have any other major questions, I think it has been a little while. And yeah, yeah. No, we uh, have finished, Amar, please we have finish with the questions. Really. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you um, uh, uh, for a great meeting today, and uh, we'll we'll continue further with uh, further webinars and uh, any. Any amazing ideas? And if anybody Ravi, of you want to Ravi, give a I presentation. A, I, yeah, Ravi, I have a question. Can can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah please. Ravi. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there's a question that if a patient has got plantar fasciitis or he can, um, we all advise them to lose weight, and uh, but they can't do some exercises, like patient having Achilles tendonitis and all. Yeah, yeah. Also, there's a patient with short cord foot. The short cord foot has healed. We advise them uh, sometimes we know that they can't do some exercises. So mm -hmm. metabolic control is very important in these patients to reduce the weight. Mm -hmm. So is bariatric surgery the answer to this loss uh, reduction in the weight for these patients who can't do exercise or uh, uh, for loss of weight? Uh, what are your comments on that? Sure. Patient with uh, plantar fasciitis, achilles tendonitis, or sharp cord sport. Your comments so, on that? So basically, at the end of the day, we have to understand nutrition is the real thing in healthcare delivery and uh, when you when when we don't have good nutrition we will end up having all these problems with uh, neuropathy and all the issues that come along with it inflammation and the reactive oxygen species and all when we take all the foods that are carb loaded uh, we tend to retain a lot of fluid so nutritional understanding is very much core to what we are going to be bringing value to this group. And there's going to be a lot of discussion down the future uh, regarding nutrition and regarding different techniques that uh, we have learned. And uh, over time, we'll bring different uh, presentations down the road also. We plan to bring in a topic of uh, 
intermittent fasting and also a discussion on nutritional focus uh, webinar and we can discuss a lot more there where we might need an hour or hour and a half of that and yeah, we'll yeah. bring in different techniques that we're going to bring up for uh, bring forth Thank and uh, uh, basically i think our next meeting also we're going to talk more about uh, different other things and uh, you, yes. you're able to see that uh, the next webinar is going to be on the 5th and uh, on 5th yeah we will talk more on that thank you so much ravi for this and i thanks all the speakers dr arun maya sir dr gul dr palvi and dr shale for the nice presentations and i thanks to my uh, co moderator dr rajneesh saxena for some nice questions he has asked on on the on on behalf of the panel on the behalf of the audience and we are proud to say that we have so many very nice audience from every part of the country and we have dr gaddafi from uh, from bangladesh he is the ipa and working in bangladesh and he is the head of the department of bangladesh so uh, dr gaddafi you can unmute yourself and say hi to the audience if you are there on, I, i've seen you you are connected and if you are there you can unmute and uh, uh, hello to you and we invite you into this forum so all the audience uh, for taking out time for this we planned this for one hour but it is more than two hours now and thank you for hosting this web and it's early morning in usa he is in ohio in lima and uh, he just got up at about 5:30 in the morning and <laughs> got connected as a host so he has hosted this uh, zoom webinar from usa and we are connected through him and thank you so much for all the uh, audience and uh, dr rinish you can thank you thank you amar thank you thank okay. you ravi for in early morning you are here thank you very much